Hi, everybody. Hi, guys. Hi. So, Ira, this is the end of the 13-day retrospective on your career. Yeah. <laughs> what, what have been your feelings this last, these last, this last week and a half? What, are you, what is your emotional state after uh, this? Um, you know, I think, I think these kind of moments, they give you a sense that there is um, something that you've created after 25 years of, of really, really, really trying. To, to make work that I cared about and that somehow revealed a part of, of my life and the things that I observed and the people that I love. So I feel, I feel a sense of, of pride. I, I, when I started, when the retrospective started, I, and I'm thinking this again tonight, my, my grandmother and my great-grandmother are both New Yorkers and uh, neither with us today. Um, and I think of them and I think, they used to come to MoMA and they'd be really proud of me. So. Really? Oh, that's nice. <laughs> well, it's kind of sweet that the retrospective ends with this film, which is, I think, more than any of your work is about friendship and about home. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to sort of ask about the development of it because I think what's great about your, I guess I'd call it like a New York trilogy, yeah. the last three movies, they all seem to sort of bleed into each other. So the, the two, the younger couple that are sort of troubled and keep the lights on become the older couple that are quite happy, although without a place to live, and in Love is Strange. And then Love is Strange ends so beautifully with the focus turning to a, a kid, right. a 15-year-old, actually, I think. Yeah. Now you begin this film in the classroom. Yeah. Um, so I want to ask you, and I guess uh, as well ask uh, Mauricio, um, the writer Mauricio, uh, exactly, yes. <laughs> yes, about just the initial impulse, the, the, the spark that started your, um, your writing process. Yeah, I mean, I will say that when we finished um, Love is Strange, which was about two 60, 70 year old men, and we had made this film about two men in their 20s, it just seemed almost our obligation initially to make a third film about this this younger generation. I think also, um, my kids are here, they're four years old, Viva and Felix, and, and they're sitting in the back there. And I, and I think at, at 50, which is my age, you know that you're not here forever and you know that things go on. And I think both Love is Strange and um, Little Men are really films about the passing of generations and the struggles that the next have in figuring out who they are and how to be adults and how to be grown-ups. And I think that's true for Greg Kinnear's character as mm -hmm. much as it is for, for, for the boys in the film. So we, we set out to make a film about childhood, but from a, from a mature perspective. I will say, and some of you, because this is a cinephile's audience, that you might know, um, we saw two films by Ozu, who's a big inspiration for Mauricio and I. Um, one is called I Was Born But, and the other is called Good Morning, and they're both films in which kids go on strike against their parents, and we thought that that was a good plot, so. <laughs> I have to say, this is not a, I have to say that, um, hello, hello, yeah, that did it, uh, when, when Ira came to me, he's the one who, who actually said, we should make a film about kids this time. Now, I was very reluctant. I'm not a father, and I knew this was very much in his mind, um, and um, I, I, I wasn't sure I was going to be able to do it, and then, um, but then, you know, in this age of Facebook, and, and, and I'm, I'm not on Facebook, but someone, someone sent me but an some old picture. <laughs> some people are. Um, someone sent me a picture of, of me in high school with my best friend, who I have no idea where he is now. And, and I said, well, I can talk about that friendship. I can talk about, you know, those friendships that at the time you used to think was going to be forever, and then you don't even know what the person is. And, and, and so I got very excited about doing this. Yeah, it's a theme that, that is very uh, powerful, the sort of melancholy of a, of a um, fleeting friendship. In production, or I guess in pre-production, the film was called The Silent Treatment? It was called a bunch of things, including <laughs> Thank You For Being Honest, which we decided was such <laughs> a good title, and since we hadn't used it for the film, we named the retrospective after it. <laughs> But what, how did you come to this title? Um, I guess it was late in the game, and it just seemed that the film 
I mean, I'll be honest, because why not? It, it, it's a film in which you're trying to figure out, it's not a film that fits within the market. And in some ways, um, I think the, the film and this kind of filmmaking, uh, you, there's a metaphor in the story, the dress shop sort of serves as a metaphor for the kinds of movies I think all of us are trying to make. And somehow they don't necessarily, they might not work in the system in which we live, but some, they have something very precious and meaningful. So we were always aware that we were making a film about two kids in a world in which kids' films are supposed to be about superheroes and, and, and that that would be a challenge. So I think there was something about specifically Louisa May Alcott's book, Little Men, mm -hmm. which I remembered, and novels have always been very important to, my, to me and to my work, that this felt like a small novel. It felt like that kind of story uh, and um, and it was about these guys yeah. in some yeah. very rich way that, that I wanted to mark with the title. Well, speaking of superheroes, Michael, uh, this is your first feature film. Yes. But do you want to brag a little bit and tell us what you've done since <laughs> this? Um, well, since Little Men Ended, I was fortunate enough to start a film called Dark Towers with Idris Elba and Matthew McConaughey. So I was in South Africa for three weeks, so that was an amazing experience. And I just finished shooting Spider-Man in Atlanta for six weeks, um, which I was very fortunate for also. Uh, just in a year, three amazing feature films that I was lucky enough to be have my name on. Yeah. I'm... Yeah. <laughs> I want to just add. I want to. I want to add one thing that he's not bragging about, which is this summer he was accepted to the LaGuardia High School for Performing Arts. <laughs> and I want to thank Michael's parents, Carmela and Mike, who are here, who've been so wonderful. <laughs> But Michael, so since this was your first feature, what did you learn from Ira, from your co-stars, that you were able to take on with you to these other films that you're in? Well, I learned a lot from Ira. I learned a lot from everyone on set. Uh, everyone said was like a mentor to me. Uh, but one main thing that Ira taught me was less is more. You know, if you're over dramatic enough, the performance doesn't seem real. And I doesn't believe in rehearsals, so that's what made the film so realistic. And if less is more, it makes it, hey, you're not a character, you're just being yourself, speaking normally, you hate lines. So mainly less is more from Ira. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it helps when you're doing less is more to have someone who's really fascinating to watch. And, and really, I mean, really, it does. It's, it's, it's sort of... Um, for me, casting is, is obviously where everything begins because you're not actually casting um, actors, you're casting people. That's who you're, you're making films about. And um, I don't rehearse primarily because I feel, A, shooting is a form of rehearsal. You end up working for hours and hours and hours and hours on a scene, but I'd rather not talk too much uh, in advance so we don't get things kind of set in any way. And, and really, I, what I try to do is create a world for these actors that, that they don't have to think. So, for example, there's a whole group of people here from Acting Out, which is the best acting school in the back. And this is a Brooklyn, uh, Bay Ridge-based um, school for kids uh, to, who want to learn how to act. And so if I'm going to do a scene about kids who want to act, then I'm going to find the kids in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, which is the neighborhood it, where the film is set. And that makes Michael enters that world as an actor. That might lead us to this guy. Well, yeah, because I, I was going to say, there is a, one scene in this film in which more is more. Yeah. <laughs> for sure. Um, it is going to be talked about for, I think, the rest of the year. What, uh, I guess, Mauricio, tell us, what I love is before that reactive exercise, is that what you call it, um, you say, you make a statement about how acting is seeing, uh, observing. Right, right. Um, Tell me how you were able to take that into the sequence that you and Michael uh, Well, first it. of all, we were shooting at the Lee Strasberg Theater and Film Institute, which is where I have been ensconced since 1975. So, so first of all, we're home, shooting at home, practically. And um, really, Ira, you were giving us little taps and sending us uh, flying. So, um, 
This, the, the comments from him uh, reminded me of things that we actually work with every day with the actors. Uh, the thing about observation, for instance, is a very important aspect of any artist's work, obviously. And for the actor particularly, observation is very important because in addition to our ability to use our experience uh, internally, our experience in life with all the events and the relationships, the hurts and the wins that we have during life, all of the internal life of the actor, but also the external life. So observing an animal and be able to imitate the movement of the animal and turning that into a human being with physical adjustments or observing another human being and being able to um, use the physical life of that person imitating so as to change who you are in the role. So when he says observation is the first thing I say, well, duh, of course you're flying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I I'll just add, um, you know, I work with Lucas Joaquin. We've made um, four films now. Lucas and I started working together when he was a junior in college, so it's been a long, we've grown up together, and I think we know it, one of the things that we need is, is the city and the things that the city has to offer. So it was Lucas on a location scout who met Mauricio and said, you need to meet this guy. Oh, Gaston. really? <laughs> yeah, because I, I didn't know how I ended up in this movie. Yeah. And, he ended, and he ended up stealing the movie. <laughs> no, it's so funny because I'm hiding at the Lee Strasberg Institute for 45 years. <laughs> and not only do they come and find you, they put you to work, they work with you in the building. You don't have to walk out the door. <laughs> Was, was that done in, in one take? Did you guys... Um, what we did is we really did bring these kids from um, acting out in Brooklyn to Lee Strasberg. And these two have been working together since you were nine, is that...? Ten. 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 So, you know, he's 14 now, just if you wanted to know. Um, so they had been working together and, and we brought the kids in. And then we probably spent maybe four or five hours shooting a class. And I had seen Meisner um, uh, and, and his work, and I really took a lot of Meisner's technique, which is the opposite of Strasbourg, but so what. Um, and uh, we did a lot of Meisner stuff within that class. Great. Um, Lucas, I want to ask you uh, about some of the casting, if you can comment on that, because I, obviously uh, Greg Kinnear is, is wonderful and Jennifer Ely, but um, I love the fact that Paulina Garcia is in this film. She plays Michael's mother. Um, this wonderful actress from Chile who was in a great movie called Gloria. How did, how did, you, how did you guys think of her? What was the um, process? Well, this is her first, this yeah. is her debut for her in a way too. Yeah. I appreciate you asking me, but I have to say, it's something that she was actually the first role that was cast in the movie and Mauricio and Ira really wrote the role with her in mind. Yeah. So, is that right? The, yeah. So Mauricio and I can probably talk. We a bit had seen more about Gloria, it. which if you haven't seen, go go rent it. It came out about two years ago, and she's such a fascinating actress. She reminds me a lot in the finished um, film of the performance of any. I made a film called Forty Shades of Blue with a Russian actress named Dina Korzun, and they're very similar performances in a lot of ways because they're both incredibly natural and actually crafted too, and you feel the craft and the, and the um, organic theatricality, which I think is a very tough thing to do in this kind of movie. And it's what, to me, makes the role so, um, and the performance so fascinating. Yeah, and has lots of edge, but also yeah. um, very soft inside. Yeah. I'm gonna uh, turn it over to the audience now and see if we have any questions from you guys to ask this panel. Raise your hand and I'll repeat. Yes, sir.
did everybody hear that? It was, it was a question about sort of the overlay of um, sexuality on the, the, the friendship that's depicted. Um, you know, it was something Mauricio and I, because we'd made these two films about gay relationships previously, and there was definitely when we had this third story, um, we talked about it a lot. And, it, and, and really what, what happened is that, uh, or what took part of the process was once we cast these two boys, Theo Taplitz, who's a, a wonderful kid from, from Los Angeles, and, and Michael, um, they were so at the same age in terms of their maturity, and that was an age in which I did not feel either the story or as a director that it was, um, that I could impose their future. It just wasn't what the film ended up being about. Um, I think there's layers of questions about who these kids become, and I think specifically, you know, I identify on some level with, with Jake as a character, but Jake isn't me. And it didn't feel um, comfortable uh, in, in, in terms of making decisions for, for who he might be. Um, so I will say, you know, one of the great things about working with these two boys is they were so, so different, and yet they immediately had uh, a, a, an affinity for each other. Um, I thought of one straight uh, Jake, if you, you, you probably would guess, but straight out of Bresson. He was like a, a model that I could just keep in a very still form, and he would, you would feel his emotions. And then there was Michael, who was just out of Scorsese, and it was like, you know, <laughs> let him loose and 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 say, see you later. And 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 so the, how I worked with them and their kind of yin yin and yang was was really part of the fun of the movie. Also, can you maybe talk a little bit about the ending, since everyone here has obviously seen it. Um, you know, you have these these two boys. My kids haven't seen it, but but they will. <laughs> two of people haven't. But this sort of unbridgeable gap that. Yeah. That well, I will say one thing about it, because I, last week I was in L.A. doing screenings, and, and I was with Theo, and there was a moment when someone asked him what was he thinking when he saw his friend across the way at the Brooklyn Museum and, and across that gap, and, and he said um, it really felt for him that he rec recognized that there was something gone, that there was something over. And as he said this, I had a, an understanding of the film that I had never felt before, which is really what the film you could say is about, is, the, is that a child realizes there is a past. Right. And that that is not something kids know until a certain moment in their life. And as soon as you know there is a past, you know there is also loss. And there is also change. And those things are, I think, maybe at the heart of the film in terms of the city, the neighborhoods, the families, and these kids. Michael, when you were filming that final scene, did, did Ira and you talk about what he was just saying about uh, knowing knowledge of the past and stuff, or was it more just walk around with your friends and? Um, me and Ira did talk before the scene shot, and you know we just he just said, you know you're in a museum with a bunch of friends, and then you don't see him, but behind is your best friend you've known for many months now, and you haven't seen him. So when I do hear about this and I see and I hear and then seeing it that my best friend is right behind me and I don't even know, you know, it brings back in my character the memories we had, you know, the scene where I had to fight over him, you know, the scene where we're playing video games and talking about his father and everything. So when I ever told me that I'm not actually seeing him, it just brings back memories and memories that could have happened but they didn't see. How many times have you watched Little Men now? Seven. This will be the seventh time. <laughs> Not bad. Anybody else? Uh, Ma'am. You're saying that you didn't want to set up the whole thing about what their relationship was, but why did you put in that uh, he had to, Jake had to write a love poem? Hmm. I mean, that didn't uh, go farther, or yeah. were you putting it in there? Yeah. A question about uh, the love poem that Jake has to write. Um, uh, to me, there is a, there is a, this is a very romantic movie. It's not, um, it's not a sexual movie, and it's a, but it is a movie about love in all sorts of forms and fashions. And, and, and so I think that resonates through the film. I tend to make films that I consider kind of open objects in a certain way, which is I think as an artist, you need to be very clear and specific and give the audience the kind of enough material to, 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 uh, to have a, a strong feeling and a sense of satisfaction of a film. At the same time, I don't mind loose ends. 
and, and, and the film has loose ends, which is sort of part of its, it's like a dress in that shop, <laughs> you know? It's, um, it's, it's its own kind of thing, and I think people, when that happens sometimes, it's a bit like the scene between the two of them, which is longer than other scenes and asks different questions. Sometimes those are the things, those little pieces that you, you can't fully solve that become part of your memory of the film and how you reflect on it. Um, you know, I, I just, just want to compliment saying that in, in writing the script, it was always um, our intent that, you know, the, the possibility of love is there. there. There's always a possibility, but never, we'd never wanted to, to impose anything more than that of the big friendship between those two boys. Yeah. Um, yes, sir. Could you speak to why you chose the seagull in particular? <laughs> Did everyone hear that? It's about the checkoff, the, the seagull. Um, well, the first thing, Greg Kinnear doing the seagull, it just seems like a natural. Um, uh, I will tell you the, the uh, you know, to me, Chekhov, obviously, like Ozu, are two um, artists who have given me permission to focus on, um, uh, on, on what happens inside homes and thinking that if you do so with enough um, precision that there can be kind of monumental things occurring. So there's a kind of um, reverence for his work. Um, in this case, uh, it's not as poetic as that, or uh, it's not as, uh, we actually wrote for this scene, um, No Exit, and that he was gonna be in No Exit. <laughs> and we were trying to get the rights for many, many, many weeks. And it turns out that No Exit is not in the public domain, so we needed rights from the Sartre estate. The Sartre estate is run by Sartre's wife. He was, he, at the end of his life, he was, he's with Simone de Beauvoir, but she did not own anything, and it's the, oh, the wife. The wife is still alive, and she lives in the south of France, and she's in her 90s, and she said no. <laughs> <laughs> So, Mauricio and I are, are in, a, in the middle of writing a film about Montgomery Clift. We've been doing that for about a year and a half. So we're, we're very deep in the world of Montgomery Clift. And um, he performed in a famous production of The Seagull. In, uh, and, and so we knew The Seagull. And we knew it was in public domain. <laughs> so it, it, it worked. Is Yolanda Ross here? Who was one of the actresses from that scene. So, um, and, and it was wonderful to, to be able to, I used to be a theater director. It was fun to do, to do that scene. And it did seem like a very earnest production. Well, yeah. <laughs> you, uh, you mentioned Ozu and Brisson. Um, I think of you when I look at your body work as sort of as our Truffaut. Did he, um, did he sort of, shine a light a little bit on this. It has to be with the kids, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, the soft, la, la peau douce, the soft skin, excuse my Memphis French, um, is, is probably the Truffaut film that has been the most important to me. Um, Forty Shades of Blue, in a way, is, is very inspired by the triangle in that film. 400 Blows um, is obviously a wonderful film that we went back to to try to think about its freedom both as filmmakers and in terms of, of childhood. And I think that's what we took most. To be honest, uh, Maurice Piala is the French filmmaker who um, has, has probably meant more to me than any other. Mm -hmm. And he made a film called Naked Childhood, his first film, which was very inspiring for us. We have time, unfortunately, for one more question. Let me take it from the back. I see you, sir, right there. Um, I think people could Everybody hear Everybody heard that. And yeah. It's a very good question because I meant to yeah, bring I mean, that up. It's, it's probably a, it's a, it's a longer discussion, but I will say that, that um, to me, uh, economics, class, our place in, in, in society um, is, you can't separate it from character and you certainly can't separate it from drama. And, and all my films are interested in how those things interact. Um, and how they define us as people and, and our opportunities and, and our challenges. I would say what we what did as writers in this film is we tried not to stack the cards um, for, any, for either side too much so that there was a kind of, I think of it as a moral 
ambiguity and a moral suspense that the audience experiences because the Greg Kinnear and, and um, Jennifer Ely, their family is not really, really rich, but they're a little more comfortable, but they're also struggling with their own things. <laughs> Paulina Garcia, Michael's family, they're, they're immigrants, but they didn't just arrive here. Their, their education is very similar, their backgrounds. And so there's, there's in a way, you're talking about a fight for the middle class and for um, the fight for, you know, any space in this city, <laughs> really. Yeah. And, and I think everyone feels that in different ways. So um, I will just say that there's a great quote someone shared with me after watching this film, and, and it's one that I, I, I had known, but I had forgotten. And, and, and the way I remembered the quote, it's from Jean Renoir, Rules of the Game. And the quote is, everyone has their reasons. And two days ago, I was in an a interview, and the, the journalist corrected me. Because the quote is not, everyone has the, their reasons, um, which is a wonderful guide as a director. The quote is, the terrible thing is that everyone has their reasons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's a, it's a much more dramatic quote. And what, is, what does John Lithgow say in Love is Strange? When you live with people, you know them more than you want to? You know them better than you, than you care to. to. Yeah. Yeah. It's care to. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that actually when a movie works, you feel, you know, for me, whether some of the movies that I love, I feel like the people in those movies are my family and they are my memories and they're part of, of my imagination in a totally personal, familial way. So I, th I think that in a way, John Lithgow, what he's talking about is the opposite of what a movie can do. Uh, you know them in the way that you want to know other people in your lives. Well, listen, it's a, it's a tender and, and, and poignant and... and Beautiful film. Thank you. I want to just thank Magnolia Pictures for tonight yeah. and for... Um, um, the, 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 film, the film opens on Friday here in New York, and um, they've been such wonderful partners, and uh, thank you all for being here tonight. Thanks, guys.